Hi, good evening. Good morning, everybody. Welcome you all to GTR. Thank you very much <coughs> for giving your time today for the webinar. Thanks, GTR, for hosting this wonderful session. And also, I welcome my panel, and thanks to every one of you for giving your time. My name is Sanjay Desai. I do supply chain advisory, as well as I do supply chain placement and talent development. I'm based in Singapore. After working for 34 years, I found my solace in running my own advisory since last two, three years, and I'm doing very well. Very welcome to each, on, each one of you who dialed in today, and thanks a lot. Uh, let me kind of take you through today in the session for the next 45 minutes, and we'll talk about India and then the tremendous growth that India has in terms of the manufacturing, in terms of supply chain finance, in terms of the growth for SMEs, and how we are going to kind of, you know, uh, give some latitude to some of the elements that each of my speakers will be talking through. Remember, India, as, as a nation, we are an industrialized nation, and it must continue to aggressively grow the Make in India movement for domestic as well as the, to meet the domestic as well as global demand. The current adversity caused by pandemic can actually become an opportunity to many of our Indian companies, either MNC or SMEs. When we talk India as a manufacturing hub, typically we must take a look at our growing number of SMEs across all sectors, obviously, along with some of the multinationals. But if you look at just SMEs as well, they grew around 10, they grew around 10 to 10, 10 to 12 percent year over year. There are roughly about 40 to 43 million SMEs in India, providing employment to about 110 million workforce and contribute almost 45 percent of the total manufacturer output. So we're talking big numbers here, and that's why I'm talking about SME when you talk about manufacturing hub. Supply chain finance is an area that is largely unused or untapped into the SME segment. Now today, our esteemed panel will be addressing some of these issues related to manufacturing, Make in India initiative, what is the roles that bank and fintechs will play, which will help the SMEs to get better at the manufacturing, to do cross-border exports, and how all these activities which actually elevate India's potential to set the tone right for the trade imbalance, which is caused by the trade ties between US and China, as well as the recent pandemic. Now, today we have an esteemed panel, and I will hand over my panel to self-introduce themselves, starting with Manpreet, Swati, followed by Gaurav and Ravi. Over to you, Manpreet. Thank you so much, Sanjay, for an amazing opening remark. And I welcome everybody to GTR India. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to whichever time zone you are right now in. I'm Manpreet Kaur Oberoi, and I am the founder and CEO of Vivanta Capital, which is an offline platform for supply chain finance and structured finance. And I've been in the industry for all my life. And after working for almost 16 years, I quit my, jo uh, quit my job and I ran into the oceans of entrepreneurship. So I'm also representing MSME segment here today on the panel because I am a startup founder of two companies right now. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to this wonderful discussion. Thank you, Manpreet. Swati. Thank you so much, Sanja, for the warm welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Swati Babil. I am CEO for Prime Dollar India. Prime Dollar is a UK headquartered fintech company and who always believes in getting some innovative and disruptive solutions in space of supply chain finance. I myself have been into supply chain and trade finance over 14 years now, and that's where my passion lies. So today's opportunity when we talk about uh, seizing the supply chain opportunity is something which is very close to my heart, and I'm looking forward to speak about it. Thank you, Swadi. Gaurav? Yeah, thanks a lot, Sanjay. And uh, thanks, everyone who's joined in today. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here on this panel. Uh, and, uh, you know, my name is Gaurav Verma. I'm uh, having an experience of about 13 years in uh, banking and trade finance, especially. Uh, I work with uh, MUFG Bank Limited, and I take care of uh, trade and supply chain finance products for India. Uh, in my regular course of work, uh, we look at uh, all types of transactions, open account supply chain finance, as well as traditional trade uh, and documentary trade transactions. So it'll be great to discuss the various aspects today uh, with, with, with the great panel that we have here today. Thanks a lot. Yes, thanks, Gaurav. Ravi. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. And thanks, GTR, for giving me this opportunity to join this esteemed panel. 
My name is Ravi Steva Subramanian. I work with uh, Barclays. I'm heading a division called Structuring and Execution and Syndications uh, for Barclays in the trade and working capital area. I am uh, based out of London, uh, career banker all my life. Looking forward to an interesting discussion this panel. Thanks, Sanjay. Excellent. Thank you very much, my panel leaders. I'm extremely lucky. And you can see that we have a panel of really diverse personalities. Even we have a great gender diversity, right? I'm very happy at the experience that the panel brings. And my job is actually, actually so easy today. So let me start with SME, right, Manpreet. And we continue to hear that the biggest hurdle for Indian SMEs has been the lack of working capital, right? It's cash, it's liquidity. But as an SME entrepreneur yourself, I just wanted to understand, is this really true? And if it is, what are the hurdles and challenges that you see? So very, very relevant question, uh, Sanjay. And before I jump into the question, I'd like to give a little perspective to everybody who's listening to this uh, conversation. So let me give a perspective of Indian MSME. So Indian MSME comprises of around 6.33 crore, which is a registered population of MSME, out of which 99% is micro, which means 6.3 crore is micro. And that is a magnanimity of the scale that we are talking about. Then comes the small enterprises, which is 3.3 lakhs. And then comes the medium enterprises, which are 5,000 in number. And just to give you now a perspective, what exactly are these micro enterprises? We go back in the times of lockdown when India with the population of 1.3 billion had the largest lockdown in the world and mm. everybody was in their homes from March till May. It was not these mega supermarkets which were servicing us, right? These were these local vendors who were the milkman, the local shopkeepers who were having the groceries who were there servicing us. And that is the kind of impact the micro segment of MSMEs have for our country. This is just, just to give you a perspective of how strong and how very huge this base of MSME is present in the country. Now, the, when I talk about capital, I would like to bifurcate the word capital into multiple aspects because capital is just not purely financial. So I would like to say, the, the issues that an MSME in India is facing is multiple with, with regards to capital. First is the financial capital. Financial capital can be in terms of a debt financing which they require from local banks or local NBFCs and fintechs. Then there's the equity financing because in micro segment, a lot of startups are also emerging now, you know, which would definitely require some, some form of seed financing or equity financing. Then we are coming to human capital. We do see that as MSMEs are still facing a lot of challenge in, gun, you know, in garnering good talent, skilled labor. If it's a manufacturing or a production unit, there's a very lack of skilled labor. If it's a service uh, oriented unit, uh, then there's a definitely uh, the paying capacity. Uh, uh, MSME would not have that kind of pay packages which an MNC or a large public limited company will be able to offer. So obviously the attraction and retention of skilled manpower is very, very difficult. We come to knowledge and resource as a capital also. Government of India has come up with a lot of incentives and programs and also with the MSME cabinet, a lot of these incentives have been launched. A budget has been announced but the problem that they are facing is the percolation or a cascading of this knowledge. So if you go to tier two towns or tier three towns, they will not even be aware of the simplest things like a mudra yojana. So these are very simple policy measures which the government has taken, but I think the knowledge pool to trickle it down and to make it available for them uh, should, should be really implemented. And I think the very important part is also the emotional capital. You know, when I talk about emotional capital, I also talk about a uh, inclusive, uh, inclusive environment, which encompasses your accelerators for startups, your incubators for startups, and even for a regular uh, business community. If somebody's starting a micro unit or a small scale unit, I, I think we need to change the mindset of asking why are you doing it. You know, we should rather be 
promoting the person, it should be encouraging and supporting them with resources. And I'd like to quote uh, Elon Musk uh, once said that, you know, instead of baby showers, we should have business showers. When a friend starts a business, we should all come in and pool resources and support him or her. And that is a mindset that I think we should be able to drive. So these are the fundamental uh, challenges which MSMEs are facing with regards to, you know, different aspects of capital. Excellent. A couple of things that you brought out, especially the, I like the idea of you know, the, what you talked about, Elon Musk. That was a wonderful view. Human capital, knowledge, visibility. I will come back to you uh, in a while uh, on some of the roles that actually can be managed, and I'll come back to you again. Let yeah. me go to the banker here, right? And, and predominantly from an Indian side. Uh, one of the statistics that I was reading, Gaurav, is although SMEs do contribute a fairly large share in terms of the manufacturing and in the growth potential, albeit obviously with the problems that Manpreet talked about, right? The M power, the people power, the bank lending or the consumption of a bank loan with SME segments is just about 15 or 16% versus the larger SMEs. Now, is there a role for a supply chain finance to actually go uh, closer to the SME segments, right? And there are schemes like uh, Atma Nirbhar, right? Self, uh, self-funding self initiatives or Make in India. And we can actually make use of it to make sure that the SMEs are actually able to fund themselves so that their manufacturing output can be raised and India can actually put a front foot ahead. Right, absolutely, uh, Sanjay. So let me begin by uh, first... Uh, you know, uh, defining the key pillars of what what is supply chain finance. I mean, it's the is the most uh, talked about topic in in uh, you know in GDR in in a lot of such uh, conclaves, uh, if I may say so. But uh, I, I think uh, for the purpose of our discussion, I'll first uh, define the key pillars. What constitutes a supply chain finance program? Okay, so first is it's an alternate uh, source of funding, right? Uh, alternate being the keyword here. Uh, different from traditional debt financing from, uh, you know, banks and let's say financial institutions. Alternate also because it gives a separate balance sheet treatment to the parties Mm -hmm. involved, whether it's on the buy side or on the sell side, or at least it is expected to give a balance sheet, uh, you know, kind of benefit uh, to the parties involved. Second, it is transactional. There has to be an underlying sale purchase contract, parties, it has to tap both ends of the supply chain uh, for any robust supply chain finance program. So, uh, you know, many people typecast supply chain finance programs only to vendor finance, but that that is actually not the case. So uh, procurement as well as sales and distribution, the optimum supply chain finance program must cover both ends of the spectrum. Uh, the fourth pillar is the credit enhancement. And I think that is more relevant uh, in terms of uh, the topic we're discussing about MSMEs, SMEs and more particularly MSMEs, uh, is that a supply chain finance program will give that credit enhancement to this working capital finance because of the quality of, uh, you know, the credit quality of the receivable from a larger corporate or uh, in general, uh, one of the parties having a much better credit profile. And last, but uh, definitely not the least, uh, rather I would put, uh, put it across one of the most important points is that a supply chain finance program needs to leverage on technology. And, and, it, and uh, a good supply chain finance program is not just finance. Uh, it is also enabling the underlying financial transactions between the parties and making, in simple terms, making life easier to do the transactions whether it's the large corporate or the small suppliers. Now, uh, coming to the question of uh, how good uh, has this percolated to SMEs or let's say even uh, rural SMEs, for example. Now, uh, about uh, 60% of India's population lives in, lives in the rural areas. And uh, if, we, if we talk about ETTs or MSMEs, I think uh, Manpreet did highlight uh, quite a few uh, very, very interesting statistics. So about 45% of uh, India's MSMEs are in the, uh, uh, you know, in the rural space. Now, yeah, sorry. So uh, whether uh, this supply chain financing, whether through banks or others, has it, has it reached the rural space? Largely, uh, you know, I would say no. 
uh, there is still a lot of uh, untapped potential to expand supply chain finance programs to the rural space to the smaller msmes and i think uh, uh, a lot of onus lies on 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 the uh, so called anchor corporates or the larger corporates and their tier one suppliers to extend this not just as a means of you know working capital finance or uh, you know extending of payment terms and the financial benefits etc but also to support their uh, you know last mile suppliers who are the msmes who are the msmes in the rural areas a lot of onus lies on 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 the corporates as well as part of their overall financial planning and uh, from a banking perspective uh, you know this needs to be achieved uh, not just by you know uh, targets or or psl targets and things like that but also also i think by uh, you know uh, getting getting this sector more formalized uh, more uh, uh, you know um, regularized uh, and and you know so that bankers you know in order to sh- uh, and especially the private sector players in order to showcase value to the shareholders and to have sustainable business model are able to take the right credit decisions are able to expand their uh, distribution to the last mile in the rural space i think uh, these these are the these are the key facets where uh, you know uh, supply chain finance uh, needs to uh, reach out to the smaller msmes and the and and, and more of uh, msmes placed in the rural areas yeah excellent gaurav couple of points you brought was visibility right outreach into rural uh, you talked about technology and then the last mile right anchor taking it a bit forward right i will reach out to swati and say e-commerce has really provided a lot of opportunities right and indian banks and government institutes have actually now embracing technology very well so is there a play for technology that they can bridge these gaps of the last mile they can take advantage of the e-commerce boom similarly on the sme side as well and which are the level which are the levers that we can actually pull together collaboratively very very relevant question sanjay you know so uh, in the industry we generally spoke about that the last decade uh, you know belong to trade finance and the coming decade is going to be with fintechs uh, right. this is what a general phenomena that we say in industry so uh, completely agree with manpreet and gaurav here that uh, um, you know re- recently our honorable finance minister set up a target of a 5 trillion dollar economy and 30% of our gdp growth comes from or contributed by these smes 60% of them are in rural areas where you know they do not really have an education or visibility of such initiatives taken by banks or financial institutions or fintechs uh, many companies or corporates have been adopting this uh, e-commerce especially to you know expand their market share Uh, you know, for the cost effectiveness and to improve the productivity. Yeah. Similarly, the banks have also taken many, many initiatives, especially in B two C segments, wherein we have seen, you know, uh, no more check issued. Um, you know, and internet banking is one example. There are some government institutions who have taken these initiatives of e booking. You know, uh, ticket booking. You know, kind of solutions have already been there. but there there has been interesting developments in b2b segments as well so you know loan application or wire transfers um, you know for that matter gst payments and giving the special gst enabled you know tools to the smes for ease of operations so cost effectiveness and ease of operations are two things which really will play a key element you know for these smes but what happens sanjay is that uh, more than 50% of these um, 6.3 crores smes uh, you know does not even have the proper you know computers or the underlying computer networks so uh, we really need to focus that these initiatives will only be successful if the uh, standardization of the operating systems or the uh, connectivity networks and everything will be uh you know smoothly function you know for the overall benefit of this these all initiatives excellent so the two point that i like was the cost effectiveness and ease of doing business and that is where i will move to ravi right mm-hmm. and ravi india's score on ease of business has been growing in, in the last uh, almost 4 to 5 years and today we are in really early 60s uh 
versus we were about less than more than 120s actually over the total population of 190 plus nations and 60 out of 200 is not too bad given that we were at 120 130 at some point of time now the country where you come from uk is on eighth so there is a lot of difference there now from a global perspective right india is today a still a better option for the fdis <clears throat> foreign development investment to come in uh, given that the trade of balance right also is now shifting people yeah. are trying to move on from china how do you see that picture especially coming from uk yeah so thanks sanjay i think uh, india has been at the forefront of attracting foreign direct investment right so there is no doubt about this uh, the short answer to your question is yes india continues to look good in terms of attracting fdi you talked about ease of doing business i think you are referring mm-hmm. to the, the world bank survey or the world bank scoring that was published uh, i think the latest one is uh, 2019 data you are absolutely mm-hmm. right that india's overall rank has improved right? but if you dig a bit deeper into that ranking you will find that certain components india is doing much much better than expected in terms of their ranking is in the high top ter- top 30s even okay but if you look at certain other factors like starting a business or registering property they are still yeah. ranking quite quite uh, low low down the chain uh, in a, in a way ultimately it's all about perception i, I just want to highlight another study i saw from a, uh, from this ngo called transparency international which is talking about corruption perception i think india is, mm. is is struggling in that in that in that perception thing you know key economies in asia uh, not just india they talked about Ind- indonesia and bangladesh they have made very slow pro- progress in addressing anti corruption and government commitments to reform have not yet materialized okay so on balance i do feel that it's moving in the right direction but further reforms are required for india to maintain its attractiveness okay <clears throat> uh, moving to shift in trade patterns uh, that's an interesting topic you you uh, you, you raised i was just listening to the uh, the previous panel sec- pa- panel pa- panel session on digitization and they talked about this as well uh, the high level view uh, for me is that india would definitely emerge as a winner as we come out of the pandemic and are looking towards global recovery um, uh, of course pandemic has, has brought brought a shock to the system it's brought, brought the whole international trade that was booming over the last 5 to 6 years to a halt um i understand uh, in 2020 the estimation is that global trade would decline by about 20% which is a significantly large number and it's not going to recover to its pre covid levels before 2023 but the recovery process is obviously going to be accompanied by shifts in trade patterns you know that's what i think we are interested in um you i think you probably referred to us china two way trade the estimate is that that is going to shrink by about 128 billion dollars okay this is a yeah. bcg study that was published recently and during that same recovery period they are expecting india U- us india to wait rate to grow by by 12 billion dollars okay? there are a few other factors that will also uh, result in change in trade patterns if you want uh, there is a ongoing global focus on environmental issues you know that's something i think uh, which is quite topical uh, europe is obviously in the in the forefront of that uh, uk is is leading the way on some green agenda and stuff uh, that is a Uh, there is a rumor about carbon tax being imposed on imports coming into europe uh, the other factor which will change trade patterns is nationalistic policies i think it started with the trump administration we saw that in brexit now in this panel we are talking about make in india which is also looking inward it's it's, it's nationalistic yeah. policies so that will change trade patterns but more importantly to the co- topic of the day which is supply chain i think this pandemic has said that uh, people have to think about uh, think about making the global supply chains more resilient from so- shocks okay um, i take it to read the uh, I, i read it as saying you know the world will take concerted efforts to reduce the dependence yeah. on china so if if that re- dependence on china is going down this could mean well for india you've already said about uh, serum institute the vaccine production and they're not just producing it for india right so that's being supplied globally as well um so i think it will definitely mean well for india in certain sectors but i have a feeling it could be broad uh, broad based as well there will be widespread uh, benefits that india could uh, could realize so in that context i feel that india should position itself in terms of its supply chain capability which is which is very yeah. important uh, i think in addition to production and logistics and envir- environment which are core components of the supply chain i have a feeling that uh, enhancement is required in aspects like corporate social responsibility and ethical yeah. issues okay so sure. uh, i'm hoping to touch upon some of these later in the session back to you now sanjay Great, thank you so much. We have a question from audience, and it says, "Do you see fintechs 
eating up the share of banks in lending to micro SMEs in developed countries and developing countries. So I was naturally leaning to Manpreet for the next question, and which is again a very similar question as the audience asked. Amidst all the initiatives that we see, right? What is the role of an, a non-banking financial institute or a fintech can play here? So again, a similar question from the audience that I'm taking. Manpreet. Thank you again. Uh, thank you audience, whoever asked that question and thank you Sanjay. It's a very, very relevant question. And uh, again, I'd like to play with numbers. So I'll give a perspective and a landscape for India right now. So India is currently 1.2 billion wireless subscri subscribers base. We have 750 million of internet users. We are one of the fastest growing market for digital transformation. And in terms of digital transactions, if I have to quote some numbers, uh, we were at 2.38 per capita digital transactions in 2014, which is now 22.42 in 2019. So that's a kind of a jump. And I'm sure post COVID, we all have observed the kind of digitalization which has happened. I mean, to quote a very, very uh, raw example, even our mothers and grandmothers know how to use Paytm, right? Uh, so these, this is the kind of impact digitalization has had during COVID. Now, coming back to the way financing has been there in the system, right? From a conventional core banking system, things are changing and evolving, and the fintechs have really emerged. Fintechs are into various, uh, various uh, criteria. It's just not into lending. They're also into back-end services, which are integrated with the APIs of the banks. Fintechs are into P2P space, fintechs are into remittances, fintechs are into uh, B2B marketplaces. So there are so many categories of fintech which have suddenly mushroomed. And they have mushroomed because there's a huge gap, huge gap uh, in demand and supply which needs to be catered to. Now, why are these fintechs uh, more advantageous in the current scenario is because of their low capex model. Fintechs don't require to have a brick and mortar you know, offices or premises in every nook and corner. They are very capex light. They are very opex light also. At the same time, they have very high, high levels of services and efficiency. The kind of digitalization which is happening, not just in onboarding a client, but also the KYC. Right now, our KYCs are linked to our Aadhaar cards, right? Somebody just needs to input our Aadhaar card and the entire description of the person applying for a loan or a bank account will be automatically on the system. Similarly, there are patterns, there are uh, artificial intelligence, there are machine learning, there are algorithms which these fintechs are using. So these are smart capabilities. The entire process of onboarding a customer, the entire process of doing a KYC is going to get completely changed. And that's why we see there are so many fintechs in different domains which have suddenly emerged. And they are not competing with the banks. In fact, in India, we have observed they are going hand in hand. It's a very complementary ecosystem which has been created. Banks are very happy because like Gaurav was mentioning about last mile connectivity, you know, Gaurav was mentioning about penetration, right, as a banker. So these fintechs are there which are actually providing that last mile connectivity. These fintechs are there which are actually bridging that gap. They're also providing not just the front end servicing, they're also providing the back end integration to the banks. So I think fintechs are here to stay. And this is a technology which is going to take the world forward, the entire process of going to a bank, talking to somebody for personally, sitting there, uh, putting, investing four to five hours in a day, resolving your issue is completely going to transform to an online dispute resolution. Sure. So, uh, I think we are pretty much on a transformatory journey. Uh, India as a startup ecosystem, FinTech is rated number one right now as an industry, which is a preferred industry for all the venture capitalists and investors. And why not? Because this is the market right now and this is what the need of the R is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred. Hey, there's a question from delegates and then uh, Gaurav, I'm going to put you on spot straight here. Apologies. The question is, how can fintechs and banks be instr instrumental in the last mile financing, anchor one level seller, as well as second level seller? So you talked about last mile, you talked about anchor. We come to you for, <laughs> for an answer, Gaurav. Absolutely, uh, Sanjay. So I'll... I'll... Uh, in fact, uh, I'll thank Manpreet for bringing out this point earlier. Uh, of course, uh, fintechs uh, are something that cannot be ignored. 
and uh, they need to go hand in hand with the formal banking system uh banks have certain uh you know regulations and compliances and the cost of distribution and compliance is very high for highly regulated entities like banks so uh the uh, the fintech ecosystem as well as the banks need to uh, collaborate get the right synergies bring in technology and and uh, one more point i think uh, uh, swati also made earlier uh, that the regarding uh, you know this telecommunication boom right we 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 are having a telecommunication boom uh, in the country uh, even if uh, there is there is uh, you know a lack of a lot of resources internet is there in almost every last mile right so we there is no other way but to you know uh, utilize or leverage technology uh, to reach to that last mile and banks uh, and fintechs uh you know they have a joint responsibility i would say from here uh, you know going into the uh, into the next uh, 10 15 years uh, which is going to be very crucial for this last, last mile connectivity so uh, smes especially who who are not able to reach out to a large set of financiers or supply chain financiers to be precise uh, can can be reached through fintechs can be reached through uh, internet distribution rather yeah. than uh, uh, you know just uh, reaching out physically and 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 uh, that will that will give the right synergies uh, you know between these two uh, you know ecosystems to to reach out to the last mile yeah <clears throat> thanks garav and and just a quick time check we got 15 minutes to uh, you know to go and we need to cover a few more things here uh there is a question from uh, from some of some of the from the delegates and the question is any thoughts on the recent green seal collapse and i would like to encourage you know uh, participants to ask questions but i would not take this question because this is a bit more straight directly targeted at at an organization uh, there are ways and means that you know compliance and regulatory bodies are there to uh, avert such things as well as organizations have their own internal compliance so i will uh, with respect i will not take the question number 4 and thank you very much whoever asked the question if you want to reach out to anybody one to one uh, all the panel are absolutely available although i could not guarantee how much of uh, bandwidth that they would have to talk about a particular organization uh, all right so let me move over and change the track bit more from smes and fintechs right just just getting a bit more uh, bit more uh, known there right i would move to swati and say the china sourcing has been under tremendous scanner and for right reasons or wrong reasons that's a different story but during the covid disruptions many us and japanese companies and koreans are actually pulling out japanese and koreans are actually giving incentives for the companies who can move out and a lot of koreans and japanese are actually eyeing india i know for myself i have been consulting at least eight or nine different companies they are moving from china into india for sure right now how our smes or even multinationals can leverage this situation and to develop a manufacturing ecosystem smarty what's your thought on that i'm i'm really glad sanjay that you brought up this topic because i think manpreet and gaurav has pretty much covered about the uh, you know the domestic scenario of the supply chain here but we we did not really touch upon the cross border supply chain finance part uh, which is a very very crucial part uh, for our economy to grow so you said uh, you know sanjay um, about over reliance on china and companies moving away from china and i on india on that note i just wanted to uh, you know uh, again share the news uh, which has been highlighted in last week um, tesla coming to india registering the company in india to set up a new manufacturing uh, base and uh, ministry offering you know uh, many reforms you know and support to uh tesla if you know i mean if they come at a certain volumes to develop this entire supply chain so you know we see that uh, these have been very evident gaps or disruptions due to covid 19 in the system liquidities had dried up uh, you know during the covid times and early payments have become you know a uh, top of the agenda for you know any company now there are certain solutions which are for cross border supply chain trade finance solutions which help any manufacturer or any corporate or for that matter any smes to manage how their international suppliers are funded and paid this would be a very 
very uh, you know key solution uh, for any company to bring down the uh, you know on street cost because raw material plays almost a 30% uh, role in finalizing the end landed cost cheaper raw material cost will definitely help the exports to boost so these are some very key uh, you know solutions that really needs to brought up the digitization uh, you know of the solutions processing the a uh, standardization of the processing of the documentation operational agility these will give india the advantage to become the uh, manufacturing hub for the world you know in may i, I remember 9 2019 november we exited from rcp um, yeah. you know after pushing seven years uh, you know uh, to have fair practices uh, you know not you know dumping too much in name of uh, free trade agreements Uh, and to practice the uh, you know fair um, you know trade practices uh, we finally decided pm decided that we need to exit from rcp and you know subsequently in may 2020 uh, you know we announced a 20 lakh crore uh, stimulus you know for make in india project so we have the ease of uh, you know labor and um, land capacity ease of operations to run a manufacturing uh you know to make india as a manufacturing hub but exactly. what makes or what creates a threat uh you know uh, or a worrisome situation for us that we are also surrounded by uh, some of the uh, manufacturing based economy like vietnam and cambodia so it is very very imperative for us to bring on the cost you know uh, to attract the investments and to attract these large buyers uh, to give more orders and the larger corporates to open up factories in india and one way to bring down the cost would be to opt for supply chain trade finance solutions this Excellent. is my this is my opinion about uh, you know cross border trades thank you so much and you brought some good points i will go to ravi and ravi if you look at what exactly swati said right as as india grows the rural sector sector grows the manufacturing grows we need to compete with you know other other countries who may have Uh, a, a lesser input cost now when you talk about inter- industrialization 4.0 specifically from an india rural sector perspective two critical elements for me that you know stand out one is csr and the second one is sustainability now their impact to supply chain is is very high the way i have seen and i have handled sustainability myself <clears throat> do you think is it more of a leadership cadence or is it more cultural and what we need to do to make sure that we really embrace it i think it's a, i would say it's a combination of factors uh, uh, sanjay i think it's an interesting topic but not much talked about even in the context of supply chain um back back home here in in the uk it is becoming a prominent feature in in when looking at proposals right so yeah. csr uh, broadly is about social accountability uh, environmental behavior and ethical construct of an organization Uh, if you translate that into supply chain we can think about sourcing and distribution of sustainable goods you know that's that's yeah. one way of looking at it but more importantly to the point that you a uh, few of you have already talked about is extending support deeper into the supply chain is also a corporate social responsibility objective yeah. we talk about second tier third tier suppliers and suppliers of suppliers who are typically smes um sure. don't get that kind of support right so uh, i think gaurav touched upon it uh, legislation can help a bit Um, yeah. India, for example, is a, is a good case point. It was the first country in the world to introduce a CSR uh, regulation, mandatory regulation, back in 2014. But for what I understand, it doesn't. It hasn't yet had a noticeable impact. Okay, so it's not just legislation that is going to help. If you look at Make in India, with uh, increasing focus on sourcing locally, producing locally, um, the domestic supply chains, you know, become more important. And I feel that large corporates and financial institutions have a much important role to play here. I think large corporates, for example, can set the scene by setting, you know, environmental and, and social standards for their suppliers to follow. Taking one step further, they can also even pledge to work only with companies which adhere to these standards. But more importantly, yeah. I think they need to go deeper into the supply chain, help the uh, the smaller suppliers, and integrate uh, them into their sustainability strategy. Often, what happens is, you know, when when you look at an SME. they they are under pressure to meet the demand from their customers right so they put into place some sustainable practices to meet that demand so yeah. I, i think large corporates have a role to play in making sure the demands are reasonable when they when they go to their smaller suppliers in the first place lastly uh, 
um, yeah. I would just say that the technology has a role to play. Digitization, blockchain, uh, distributed ledger technology. You know, if we can find a way to actually certify the supply chain in terms of its uh, CSR and ethical standards, that will go a long way in extending financing. As financial institutions, we don't. We, we were traditionally not looking at it. I think Gaurav yeah. mentioned what we look at supply chain finance. Uh, is it more working capital benefit, extending payment terms for the buyer, and providing cheaper financing for the for the suppliers? But um, increasingly, we are looking at uh, CSR as, as, as an angle and ethical issues as an angle when we assess proposals. So, you know, if you want to make sure that uh, a large corporate has standards set in that organization to assess the supplier in doing due diligence on those suppliers, and we take comfort from that. Uh, okay. It's a reputational damage compared to financial incentive. Thanks, Sanjay. Thank you for an all-inclusive answer. I appreciate it. Manpreet, there is a question that I want to uh, put in spot here straight. We have almost... 1500 startup and this question has come from our, one of our delegates we have almost 1500 startups in fintech in india to date with almost 150 of them vc funded and thriving every day to eat bank's cake right so the final question is which is which is a long write up and also do we see formation of a subprime msme space over time 2 to 5 years from now that we had in mortgages in 2008 Amazing question, Manpreet. Can you take this? Sure, I'd love to take this question. So I think the very premise of subprime happens when the market is saturated. When you're yeah. giving somebody which he is unable to chew or he's unable to take more, right? He has privileges of choosing one, two, or three. MSME, yeah. it does not have that privilege. Just to give you a perspective again, when we talk about Treads as a platform, which is one of the most integrated platform, which under RBI is trying to cover all the MSMEs in the country. So far they have done brilliant, but they have been able to onboard only 25,000 MSMEs out of a population of 6.3 crore. Can you imagine the gap which is existing? So for us to reach a level of subprime and to be yes. abundantly funding them, I think it will take us, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to quote a number, but it will take us a long, yeah. long time. Plus, second thing I would like to say is our regulatory sandbox. Our regulatory yes. sandbox under the governance of Central Bank of India is so super strong that a subprime crisis, I don't think is something which India will ever be impacted with. Exactly. You know, plus the, the, fintechs, the fintech regulatory sandbox as well as the banking, which is so, so strong. So I don't think this is going to be a situation whereby uh, uh, we will end up lending to MSMEs, which they cannot absorb, or we are giving them, we are approving all kinds of bad loans. I don't foresee that. Another sure. point I'd like to make is a psychological analysis and the credit risk uh, parameters, right? So when you're lending to a micro, small, or medium enterprises, your lending criteria is absolutely different as compared to a mainstream bank when you're lending to a regular large market account, right? Your nuances of credit checks, your nuances mm -hmm. of how you are ascertain, how will you ascertain a risk of a T vendor? A banker cannot ascertain that risk, right? How will you ascertain what is his capex? How will you ascertain how much is cost? You will have to actually study how much of a milk he's consuming every day, which is OPEX. You will have to actually calculate how many uh, you know, glasses he's consuming every day. That's his OPEX, right? So these are the models which these fintechs have been able to devise indigenously. You know, they've been able to go there, research, do their R&D, and come up with these risk analysis models, which are very different from a mainstream banking. And that is why they are more robust, and that is why they are last mile, because they understand the KYC or the actual New York customer criteria. Fourth aspect I'd like to highlight is that, and I think uh, both... Ravi, uh, uh, Gaurav, which are bankers, and Swati would also agree. Uh, delinquency percentages uh, in MSME portfolio has been the lowest by far. And I think my banker friends on the panel will agree with me because there's a psychology, <laughs> there's a psychology which comes here. Uh, if you lend to MSME, they are more obligated. Uh, they will be more liable to pay back their debt compared to any large a uh, corporate client who probably might have higher levels of delinquency or NPA. Yeah. Uh, I think my bank of friends would like to agree in terms of statistics. I don't have the actual statistics with me, but that is a very proven fact, which all banker friends of mine have told me that. So uh, whoever has asked this question, thank you so much. Uh, but your worry is absolutely uh, uh, not needed. 
we are safe and i don't think msme is going towards any kind of subprime crisis yeah, yeah amazing manpreet and then you brought a few couple of points and i'm very proud to say that in 2008 uh, i mean our sandbox of regulatory is so strong in india which reflected in an indian actually pointing out in 2007 and the 2 billion dollar meltdown to america but nobody listened to him and then everything crashed right and that was an indian guy who actually pointed out so that actually speaks what you said we have a few minutes left but i want to take a very good question from one of the delegates and gaurav i'm going to go to you again how important is the role of secondary market remember again we come back to the secondary market like of reinsurers in closing the gap of supply chain finance is it poised to grow or would lose its importance slowly that's a great uh, question uh, sanjay thanks and thanks uh, to the uh, delegate who's asked this question uh, so uh, Uh, of course uh, the role of a secondary market is only going to increase uh, i can say that with a lot of conviction uh, i'll pick up from uh, some of the points manpreet made about uh, trades exchange for example it's uh, one of the most fantastic experiments in supply chain finance uh, uh, you know that uh, the government and rbi is is leading and uh, from what we've seen in the last 2 3 years it's yielding excellent results and there is definitely a lot of potential uh, so now we have uh, you know testing already on for insurance of uh, you know such assets such receivables which are uh, financed under this scf platform and and not just limited to trades uh, you know there are a lot more uh, ecosystems or fintechs and platforms that are coming in and uh, where the role of uh, the secondary market becomes uh, you know extremely extremely important uh, for finance for credit insurance uh, we we uh, you know uh, there is a lot happening on credit insurance allowing uh credit insurance uh, you know for receivables finance or factoring in india uh, irda had uh, done a lot of work recently has published a white paper there is some testing going on with one of the trades exchanges as well so uh, uh credit insurance uh, secondary market uh, for funding of uh, receivables finance uh, exchanges uh, and all other uh, 2b or 2b formalized supply chain platforms uh, the way is only up from here and and uh, there is immense potential Uh, like uh, you know almost all our panelists have mentioned uh, mentioned here today we are just at the tip of the iceberg especially in the msme space so uh, yeah that's that's uh, the take for you on this one thanks excellent excellent thank you so much all my panel members uh, you can imagine we have been speaking for almost 47 minutes live and we covered a kind of pretty good areas right we each of us have have kind of addressed pretty substantial amount of areas and i'm very proud to say that they were five to six questions other than banning one question we have taken all from all the questions that came in thank you very much all the delegates who have raised the question thank you very much each one of you we have a time limit that we need to close our session so thanks a lot again for your participation <clears throat> making it very interactive and pretty sharp neat and clean thank you so much for everyone thank you gtr thank you all delegates bye bye thank you